Hello friends of .NET, I'm Imo Landworth and you can find me on Twitter at TerraJobst. In this episode we're going to do something a little bit more elaborate. Uh, I don't have a demo today because we will not change much of our resulting program, but instead we will lower our program into a simpler representation. Like if you think about it, if statements and while loops and for loops, at the end of the day all they do is basically are just glorified, um, you know, go-tos effectively. And so what we will do today is we will add the ability for us to rewrite our intermediary representation that we have built so far into simpler constructs. And that's also the kind of stuff where we could do optimizations like you know, inlining or other crazy things if you would like to do that. Um, it's a pretty common thing in compilers, so I think the episode will be a lot of fun. So let's just jump right in. So first of all, I verified that I'm live on YouTube, which is uh, apparently a problem in the past. So. Hopefully today this will all work out just fine. Um, so I've received a number of pull requests, which is awesome. So let me just take a look at um, some of these here. Um, interesting. Interesting. All right, let's start with these guys. Um, yeah, there's something really weird if I'm in full screen um, browser mode. For some reason, I can't switch the tabs. Um, all right, swap the expected and actual parameters for assert, equal, and lexer tests. Oopsie. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. That's awesome. I have no idea why that happened. I guess the test always passed, so it didn't matter which side it was on. Um, um, yeah, mildly embarrassing. <laughs> See, I can't even spell the word embarrassing. It's so embarrassing that I can't even do that. <laughs> All right, so then let's just click the merge. Interesting, did we mess up the link? How is that possible? Yep, we did mess up the link. That's impressive. You would think that at least I get things like this right, right? You, because when you add a link, you would think you would at least visit that link once. <laughs> uh. That's the kind of thing we have to drink a coffee on. Cheers. All right. So, <laughs> oh, that's the best pull request. I got a little bit carried away and managed to implement what you had up in episode six. I must say, it was challenging, but I had fun. Um, Awesome, I got your name right. Now that is, yeah, that is awesome. So let's just take a quick look. I think, honestly, this is the kind of stuff where, um, oh, I see, I see, I see. This is just easier. Okay, you just, oh. Da, 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 da. Ah, this is cool. Yeah, I was about to say, I don't want to take pull requests that basically add like genomic chunks of functionality because the point of the project is to live stream that work and give the pull request later as a, as a, as a learning exercise. But um, yeah, I mean, I would encourage everybody to do exactly what Tice does. Like basically just download the stuff, play with it, and uh, have a lot of fun with it. I mean, like the, the, the other thing I would highly recommend, by the way, if you haven't seen them, I, I've tweeted about this. There's this book called... Um, well, I should say books, actually, because it's really two books, writing a compiler in Go. 
and there's also the precursor writing an interpreter in Go. And um, it's written by uh, Thorsten Ball, which I think is German, actually, so I should get that name right <laughs> off the bat. Um, so basically what he does is he has two, two books. One is writing an interpreter, the other one is writing a compiler. And in the interpreter book, basically what he does, he does all the front-end stuff, like parsing, lexing, and then effectively doing what I do currently, which is just evaluating this thing as an interpreter, right? And then the second book is basically replacing the interpreter with um, uh, a bytecode representation. Um, and then he has a what he calls the VM, which is basically just the bytecode runner, if you will. And um, so in a sense, you can think of this book as basically being our, our next step, which is writing IL. Uh, because his his fake language, the the the, v, the VM that he built, is effectively like uh, .NET's IL language, where you have a stack-based uh, uh, evaluation expression mechanism instead of registers, and then you just run that guy. So the books are pretty short. They're like, I don't know, 300 pages, but they cover a lot of other things. Like as he's writing stuff, he's also adding tests to that. And so it's you know a pretty quick read. I think I finished both books in pretty much a weekend. Um, uh, I mean, of course, I'm reading fast because I kind of know where he's going anyway. I'm just more like curious how he explains things and what he actually does. But I don't know. If you want to learn Go and you like compilers, I think it's a, it's a, maybe not the best book to learn Go because it doesn't really talk about how Go works. But it's a, it's a nice book to just see some Go code in action and uh, read about something you might actually care rather than some Hello World examples in Go. All right. So then this one is uh, easy. It's just adding a few test cases. Yep, to and true, false or false. Var a equals 10 should be 10. Uh, yes, that is right. That seems logical. And let me just say, awesome. And we just merge that. All right, so let's talk about this one here. So. Um, Dimitri added this, uh, actually it's awesome, he actually has a, has a GIF now, uh, where he just showcases effectively what you want. So one of the problems that you have when you type stuff on the client line uh, is that you normally get with the up and down arrows, you get history. So you don't have to you know, type things over and over again, especially when you made small mistakes. Uh, and he does that basically by depending on a NuGet package. When I saw this, my initial reaction was, well, do we really want to depend on a NuGet package to do that? And then I thought a little bit about that, and uh, I concluded that in order to really do this in a great experience, I kind of cannot use console write line, uh, con sorry, console read line anymore. I kind of have to, um, yeah, basically think about what happens when you when you when you uh, when you basically wait for input, right? Basically, when you say read line, what you really do is you you say read key, you wait for keyboard commands, and then you know when you get you know typing or backspace or whatever, then you actually intercept those. And then you can actually provide a much richer experience. And yeah, similar to ties, I got carried away. So I actually played with this a little bit. Um, let me just quickly show you uh, what that would look like. So nothing spectacular here. So we have our run, run thingy. I can say 1 times uh, 15. Um, I can say 100 minus 10 times 100. And what you see now here is we even get syntax highlighting. So you know operators are dark gray. Um, if I say let x equals 100, then I get that sort of syntax highlighting. And uh, I also have history ability uh, by just going back and forth. But what's really cool is like very often when you do things like this, when you say uh, you know let's say you say uh, let result equals zero, you hit enter, and you're like oh damn, I really wish I would have typed var result equals uh, zero. So now you can just do backspace, and you go here, and then you just you know go back here and change it to var, and then you say uh, you know for uh, um, i in uh, what is our syntax? <laughs> it's, it's been too long. Um, result is result plus one, and then we say result, and then we get that evaluated. And now when I go back in history, I actually get the multi-line experience as well. If I now use up and down arrows, I can just go around this, this block of code here, and I can say, and actually what I meant was uh, plus i. And then when I hit enter, then that guy evaluates. Um, and then yes, there's a few bugs I have when it comes to uh, 
printing stuff on the command line and I have no idea what's happening now. Why do I get garbage output here? Oh, because I'm now in the German keyboard layout. That makes sense. And now nothing works, of course. So yeah, so that's basically what I'm, what I'm planning on doing. So that is why um, uh, I will not take this pull request uh, because I, I, so first of all, I, I'm generally not a fan of taking dependencies on, on what amounts to, um, you know, small, small packages that are like kind of dubious in value when you basically want to write this uh, anyway yourself. And I don't know whether you followed the Node community recently, but they had a big flare up where a very commonly used package inserted some malware. And so I think in general, you should think of your dependencies and only take things when you really, really, really need them to. Um, and in our case, given that we want to write a better REPL anyway, it seems a bit um, over the top to depend on a, you know, a read line you get packaged that, that, that does kind of like 5% of what we want to do. All right, so then let me just say, um, as discussed on my live stream, This is super cool, but I think we can do much better by a custom implementation um, of this functionality. Functionality that also provides syntax highlighting and multi-line, uh, you know, history. Um, now I fix my typos, blah, 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 and there is a close and comment. Um, um, generally speaking, though, this is an awesome idea. Uh, all right. And then this one, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I think I will butcher your name. I think it says Jitas or Jitash uh, is asking, are you using a Windows virtual machine in Mac? I do not. I use Bootcamp, so I'm booting natively into Windows. So there's no way for me to switch to the Mac OS portion right now. And the reason I do this is because Windows is a jealous operating system and uh, it really wants all the memory you can get. Um, no, that's not true. Like you can totally run uh, Mac when you, like in, in VMware, sorry, in VMware or in, in Parallels. My experience is just when you use Visual Studio uh, and you really want to use the memory and you you know do a lot of you know more heavy lift, lifting, it gets a bit tedious to use VMware, um, and so I basically stopped using VMware and I'm, I'm just rebooting because I'm also not switching back and forth that much as it turns out. Like I pretty much have either a Mac day or I have a you know a Windows day. And in my case, it's if I do programming, it's a Windows day. If I do uh, Photoshop or video editing, then it's a it's a Mac day. And between these two, you don't toggle that much. All right, so I think I talked about this last time. I think this is, I, I convinced myself that this is, uh, this is good as it stands. And so we'll just merge that as is. And uh, here we go. We did our homework. Booyah. Now let's actually go back to master. No. No way. Yeah, this is already a good morning, I guess. Can barely type git commands. Um, git check out master. Git pull, and then we say git check out dash b episode eight lowering, and here we are. All right, let me just open my notes so I don't forget what I'm trying to do here. So yeah, the one thing we didn't do last time, which I still want to do, um, and it's not really worth doing another episode on this, is just adding bitwise operations. Um, so right now, we have no ability to do just the normal bit fiddling stuff, which you kind of need in a programming language in order to do some you know, basic stuff, like, I don't know, formatting numbers and other stuff. Um, so let's just do them quickly. Yeah, so let's just add the tests, maybe. Always a good starting point. Uh, yeah, which. Again, I have not done this in a while. Apparently, I can no longer find my own programming. So, where would that go in? So, we would have somewhere here, I think, would be a good point. So, what do we have? So, we would say we want to do, uh, what is it, one or two should result in three. Um, 
one and one. So one and two should result in, I guess let's do two and three should result in, uh, it doesn't really matter. One and two results in one. Mm, kind of want to say one or zero results in, uh, this is resulting in one. And then uh, one and zero should result in zero. And then we have XOR. Um, that should result in this one. Zero X or one should result in this one. And then lastly, one X or three should result in zero. No, it should result in Um, apparently too stupid to do bit one manipulation in my hand. So this is the, the one, um, and then this is the, well, we'll find out. <laughs> so let's just do them as we go fit. So these are bitwise operators, right? So it's just it's very simple. You just say, you know, bitwise or bitwise and bitwise X or, and then they're obviously also defined for, um, for Booleans. So that's the same thing here. We would just say, well, what do we have? So we would say false or false is false. Actually, don't, don't I already have them. Yeah, I guess false or false should be false. Uh, false or true should be true. And then I guess true or false should also be true. And then true or true should be true. Now we do the same thing with and. Uh, that is false. That is also false. False. Um, That seems somewhat on the reasonable side of the house. And then we do the same thing with X or. So we say true or true should be false. Now let's start like we did earlier. False or false is false. Um, true or false should be true. Uh, false X or. True should be true, and then uh, true x or true should be false. And then I think the only other operator that we want to want to have is bitwise negation, which would be probably somewhere here. So we would say, uh, yeah, I have no idea what. The one's complement of one would be. <laughs> Let's just say it's two, and then we will just fix the number to what it actually ends up being. Um, and is that defined for Booleans as well? I don't know. Let's just go with no for now. And then just live with the outcome. So. All right, so now we have to find what we want. There was um, the, shouldn't one and two be zero? Good question there. We will find out. We will find out. <laughs> I'm bad with a bit of manipulation in my head, um, especially when I only had a part of my coffee yet. All right, so how do we add the operator? So we start, as we usually do, we start in our lexer, um, which would be here. So what do we need? We need the tilde operator, which I guess we can just put here. That would be tilde token. 
Um, yeah, we will write those guys here. To follow this pattern, so we say if this is uh, not, then it is an ampersand token. Otherwise, it's an ampersand ampersand token. If only my clipboard wouldn't suck so much, or I would not suck so much at the clipboard operation. So then this is that guy, and I do the same thing here. They call this the pipe token, and then this is the pipe pipe token. So let's do this. Add this guy. Add this guy. Now let's get these guys into the right spots. Uh, percent, and then there we go. That should take care of that. Um, yeah, in order to get them recognized as operators, uh, the only thing we have to do is to go to our syntax facts um, and just add them at the right priority. So these ones, I think, are all the same priority. I don't think anybody, I don't think there is any other ordering. Um, Um, yeah, the ampersand token is basically the same priority as this guy, and then same thing here. That would be the same priority as this guy, um, and then X or I guess uh, would be here, so which we obviously didn't add. So we need to add this guy. Um, where would we add that? I guess logically would probably be somewhere here and we just call this the the head token which goes somewhere here all right so good enough I'd say for that one yeah then we just have to add the bond operators and our binder, so same concept here. We have our bound binary operator, we have our bound unary operator. So we'll start with the unary ones. Um, uh, da -da 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 -da. Yep, we have the uh, tilde token, and we say this is bound operator type uh, ones complement. Right. And then the binary side, um, let's start with the bool ones. We have the these guys here, which we call bitwise and. Pipe token, we call this bitwise. Uh, bitwise or and then we add one more we call this the hat token and then we say this is bitwise x or And then same thing here, we would say probably here before the, so we say this is the uh, ampersand token, and then we say this is the um, pipe token, and then the hat token. And then we say this is, uh, what did we say, bitwise and bitwise or and bitwise XOR. That should do that. Um, yeah, what remains is the evaluator now.
So now we say, well, I'll start with uh, bitwise and bitwise or, and then what is that? It's a bitwise XOR. So the problem now is you have to handle both sides being either ins or bools. What is the best way to do that? We can probably say if left, well, if B, well, if B type is of type, uh, type of int, let me do that, else we cast them to bools. Let me do this for all of those guys, and then basically this is just uh, bitwise and. Uh, this is bitwise or, and then this is uh, x or. Seems reasonable. And then I think our, this guy here also needs this guy, so this would be, what do we say, once complement, uh, we would say this is int Now, does C-sharp actually have the ones complement defined for bool? No, it does not. That's what I thought. Okay, so good choice only doing it for instant. All right, so now let's see. Let's see how bad it is. Oh yeah, you only have 109 test failures. So, interesting, our precedences are messed up. How is that possible? How is that possible? Oh, the precedence is possibly messed up. Um, is it possible? Yeah, John Galloway says, looks good to me, ship it. <laughs> 109 test breaks. Uh, funny, funny, funny. So, okay, I think it's probably going to be somewhere I messed up. Uh, I must have messed up something where my answers are not consistent. So. The head token has the same priority as the other guys. That seems fine. Tilde token. Hmm. Did the Lexer return the wrong things? No, head token is head token, ampersand token. So if current is not an ampersand token, then we return an ampersand token, otherwise we return an ampersand, ampersand token. Okay, same thing here. If the current is not a pipe, then we return a pipe token, otherwise we return a pipe pipe token. Can't really mess that one up, can you? And then this one is a tilde token, so it's, well, that's fine. Huh. Yeah, this is mildly annoying. So how do I debug this? So what is the problem? So we say honest precedences. And then we say binary expression honest precedences slash token assert failure. Expected binary expression actual name expression. Um, Okay, so maybe the easiest way to do that 
is to just run the evaluator tests. So maybe we just start with like, commenting some of the test cases out. I mean, there's also a test runner, but I honestly have forgotten how to set this guy up. So let's just do the easy thing and start by just saying, nope. Nope. And then same with Lexer tests. Um, I guess those should just work. Well, I don't. I know they don't because there's some uh, um, things we have to make sure. But now we have at least only four failed tests. Now that's much more reasonable. Uh, expected zero, actual two. Yeah, I think somebody mentioned that one x or three should be two. So we can fix that. Um, one x or three should be two. And then what's the other test break? Um, oh yeah, I can't do that. That's right. Oh yeah, the glorious console. Where line wrapping is not what you want it to be. Um, all right, so we have one and two expected one, actual zero. Does that make sense? Yes, of course, that makes sense. One and two, I think what I meant was one and three. And then the other one was tilde one. Um, should be minus two. I think that sounds about right. Um, Covers all tokens. Yeah, so empty. Tilde, hat, ampersand, and pipe. Oh, I know what the problem is. I know what the problem is. Yes, yes, yes. So what we should have done in our syntax facts is also add this guy here. So if you ask for an ampersand token, I give you back an ampersand token. If you ask for a pipe token, I give you a pipe token. And if you ask for the hat token, I give you the hat. And uh, yeah, I guess this location is as good as any. If you ask for the uh, tilde token, I give you back uh, this guy. Right, so now we have the other test failures. So same thing, token pairs, you cannot have an ampersand token followed by an ampersand ampersand token, which makes sense. So that goes back into our, which combination we can actually test. Uh, so this is our method here, require separator. So if the left side is an ampersand and the right side is an ampersand, um, ampersand, then the answer is I need that. Or of course, if the other side is an ampersand, ampersand token, then that's also the case. And then we do the exact same thing for the pipe version. And that should take care of pretty much all the Lexer failures. Well, that's nice. Um, now let's go to our test and let's undo them. Yeah, 
right, so now theory is also start to parse again. Theory, theory. Nice. All right, so this one, this one, this one makes sense. These ones make sense. We registered those guys, that makes sense. We added them here, that makes sense. Yeah, let's un yeah doesn't matter, let's add this guy there. Um, one's complement, yep. Uh, yep. Yep, 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 till the um, yeah, that's what I would expect. All right, git commit uh, dash m add support for bitwise operators. Yeah, I wish there would be something like Ncrunch for VS Code. I have to say, like, the test run experience on the command line is, let's just say, not exactly where you want it to be. I mean, what I do have, there's this add-in here, which I install, which is basically the .NET Test Explorer. The problem is, there's some configuration I have to add, which I haven't done in a while, and I don't want to spend time right now to do that, because normally my tests don't break that bad. <laughs> uh, Famous last words, episode eight, uh, lowering. Which ironically we haven't even started yet. But hey. All right, so. Booyah, so Wilbur's operations, done. Now, we want to rewrite our bound tree, right? So just a reminder, we have syntax. So we go to our, uh, to our compilation. How do we compile right now? Well, basically what we do is we first parse, then we get a syntax tree, and we construct a compilation object out of that syntax tree. And when you say evaluate, what we do is we say, well, do we have any errors in the syntax tree? Or do we have any problems binding our global scope? And our global scope basically just binds the, yeah, the whole syntax tree root uh, into effectively a, a statement and then we just execute the statement. And the statement is basically our bound tree, right? So we already have a representation for our syntax uh, that is tree-like. So our syntax node has a get children thing where we can just generically walk over our syntax tree. And we just do this by reflection because we are lazy. And I kind of want to do the same thing for the bound node, right? Right now the bound node doesn't have a way to get the children. So I wanted to bootstrap myself here. What I will just do, I will just blatantly copy what I've done here and just adjust this to our, to our needs. On the bound node. So of course that's not exactly what we want to have here. So we say children is bound node. Yes, we need reflection for that. So if that's the case, then get it, return it. If it's an enumerable of bound node, then get that and return those guys. And of course you need this guy for that. That's fine. Text writer, you need IO probably. Yep. Syntax node, no, we don't want to do that. We want to say bound node. Probably need system for that. All right, so this is where we have to adjust things. So, yeah, let's just do this. Let's just say here, write node. Uh, writer node. Uh, 
and then we say right uh, yeah let's just do this for now so we actually have a way we need probably link for that yeah um, and then we say right node is basically well what do you want us to do we want to say uh, ha, 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 ha. oh yeah so there's a few things I want to make a little bit easier to read on the eyes, but let's just start simple by just saying uh, writer dot write no dot kind. Probably good enough for now. All right, let's say to do uh, handle binary and unary expressions and to do uh, change colors. Um, but that at least compiles for now. So I want to get this out first. So then, okay, we have that guy. Uh, in order to for us to do that, actually, what we want to do in our REPL, because we don't want to just always blindly output the tree, that would be annoying. And we already have a show tree thing, but I think we want a different one because syntax is not the same as the bound tree. So we just say show program, maybe. And then we just say, um, show program showing bound tree not showing bound tree uh, while we add it might as well just add the period because it has bugged me for a while as well and we say var show program is false and then yeah Then I guess we could do that here. And then we say if show program. And then we say, well, how do we get the bound tree? We don't, so we probably add a method here like emit tree. And we just say write that puppy to console out. And then let's just keep this somewhat compact as well. All right, and this is basically just saying uh, global scope uh, statement write to writer. And then we say write to writer. Let's see what we've done so far. So let's say uh, show program. And then we say one times three. Here we go. And we see we have an expression statement, a binary expression, little expression, little expression. So this is uh, not the syntax, this is the bound representation, which is the difference. So for example, if I say uh, two times three, sorry, uh, two plus three times eight, then you see there's no parenthesized expression here because it's just the bound representation, in which case parentheses don't show up. If I would say show tree, and I would do the same thing here. Well, now you see we have this is the syntax representation that we that we emit, and then this is this is the boundary representation that we have. Um, uh, so, not the same. Now the only thing is the, you know, the representation is a little bit hard to read. Um, so let's start by saying um, there's this bound node. Uh, let's have a method private uh, console color color get color for bound node node. So we can say if node is bound expression, then I want this. How did I think it looks good? Blue, I think we said. Return console color blue. And then if node is bound statement, then we say return console color cyan, uh, else return console color yellow. Yes. So we say console 
foreground is get color for node and then we say console reset color so that solves that problem yeah should be static <coughs> Okay, that's already much nicer. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to say if node is binary expression, sorry, bound binary expression B, and let's actually do this the other way around. Let's call this um, bar text is um, get text uh, for node. And then we just say if node is binary expression B, return B O P kind to string plus expression. So the idea here is that you know I make it a little bit more compact so that the operator is basically part of the name. Uh, bound unary expression U, we do the same thing, except we say obviously this, and then otherwise we say return node kind to string that I think makes that already quite readable as well so let's try this one more time so we say uh, show program um, and then we say okay if an expression statement multiplication expression literal expression literal expression all right that's not horrible However, like we want more details, so we want to also see the properties of this guy. So let's add another method here, write properties, write properties, properties, writer, note. Um, so yeah, what is properties? So let's actually have another method here. That works in a similar fashion. But let's say this guy can be private. And so we say the property is what? String name and then uh, I don't know, object value, let's say. Right? It's basically a bunch of key value pairs. So what are we not caring for? Well, If it's one of those guys, then it's basically something we handle already. Oopsie. Um, then we say continue. Dup, 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 dup. All right, I guess. Uh, we say this is value, and then we say, yeah, let's say if value is not now, then we say return uh, property name, comma, value. Properties that we don't want to return, so if property name equals name of uh, kind, then we say, Return, uh, continue. All right, we don't want to return this guy, and we also don't want to return, I think, the. Um, I guess, good for now. Right, good enough. What's your problem here? 
oh yeah it's called get properties obviously um, all right so then we have that it should actually already look quite nicely show program one times three oh yeah it helps <laughs> If you want to call this too, my property is so what do we do? Uh, we say for each bar p in node get properties. Uh, we say console right line. No, console right. Um, Um, ba, 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 ba. Actually, I'm thinking about it. I don't want to do what I'm doing right now. That is a bad idea. Because we need to guard these calls here. If is to console then do that, otherwise don't. And then it's the same thing here. Um, so after we wrote this guy, I want to write the property. So we say, write or write, obviously. Um, uh, P dot name followed by this, followed by p dot value. And then, so you want to say var is first property, true. If it's first property, then uh, is first property is false. Else we say writer write write a comma. So now the only thing is we want to say is to color if it's to the console, then we would like to set uh, this one to console color. Let's say dark gray, because it's just a comma. Right. And then we say, well, we would like the name to be in, let's say, yellow. And we want to see the value in, let's see, dark yellow. Something like that. And then we can say, oh yeah, we crashed. What, ha what happened? Uh, da, 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 show program. Oh yeah, I'm an idiot. That's fine. Almost. Yeah, so I think what I want to do is I want to say, well, That should fix that one. Yeah, 
Yes, that seems reasonable. Yeah, I think the other thing is you don't want to emit the operators. So if the name is this guy or property name equals name of uh, bound binary expression operator, then continue. So show again, show program, one times three. Nice. All right, so that is, I would argue, pretty nice to read. So I think this one is worthy of being checked in. So I see there are no questions, which is always fun, which means I either lost everybody or it's all obvious what I'm doing. Uh, all right, so show program, we did that. Yeah, we moved those guys. Added a bunch of stuff here. That allows us to just emit this guy. And then we say add ability to ability to output the bound tree. Nice. All right. So now we say we want to have a lower rise. So one hour remaining. <laughs> okay, one person is at least saying they're not lost, which is good. Thanks, Frederick. All right, so where are we? I think we need a new folder here. Let's do this. Let's add this thing called lower ring. And let's say, oops. What just happened? Oh, I just collapsed it. I didn't type here, let's call this lowervar.cs. Um, and uh, let's just do that. Lowering, and then we call this lower. Um, Yeah, the thing we need here is we need a internal abstract class uh, bound tree rewriter. And so this guy here is just inheriting from this guy. And then this guy is right now where the heavy lifting is. So we have a public abstract um, let's say bound statement and we call this rewrite statement. Actually no, let's say bound statement is I'm uh, sorry, uh, bound node rewrite node bound node node and then we say switch node no we say uh, if node is bound uh, statement there's really only two top level concept right statement and then we say return rewrite statement for note uh, uh, for s obviously and then we say else if node is bound expression e then we say we write expression else we say throw new exception Uh, we say unexpected note, note kind. Um, yeah, obviously not. But let's mark this. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I think that's a bad idea. 
let's not have that method. Let's instead just do that. We have a public bound statement. Statement? Yeah, that's better. All right. And then we have another, uh, we're going to call this public virtual, public virtual rewrite expression. And then that is a bound expression. And we call this node. And we call this guy node. Right, and then we say here, switch node kind. And then of course we have our traditional default where we say throw new exception unexpected node node kind. Right, and so Case bound node kind. Uh, binary expression. So let's just get all the expressions. Da, 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 da. Uh, return uh, rewrite something like that, right? Perfect. And then we just start with these guys. Yeah, and it would totally help if we have put this in the right in the right section here. And so of course they are all bound expressions. Return node. Let's start with that. And then, of course, they are all uh, protected virtual. All right, so what does a literal expression rewrite look like? Well, there's only really one thing in here, so that's fine. Variable, same thing. Assignment expression. Well, so what do we have? An assignment expression has an expression. So we would say var expression is rewrite rewrite expression if expression is not the same as node dot expression uh, or I should say if it is the same then return node otherwise we say return new bound assignment expression that passes in the node variable and then the new expression. What's your problem here? Yeah, of course. All right, so that's basically that. Unary expression, I think it's more or less the same thing here, except that expression is called uh, uh, operand, I think. So then we call this operand. And then we say, well, it's about unary with the operator and the operand. And then we say here, this is um, left. Let's call this right. And then same structure. So if left equals 
node left and right equals node right. Then return this guy, otherwise, well, bound binary expression with um, our left, the node operator, and the new right. Right, so now let's do the same thing here with the statements. Jib, 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 jib. You say case bound uh, node kind um, return rewrite something like that. And now let's add these guys. So, I think this code I've already written. So expression statement, well, we just say this is an bound expression statement for the given expression. What does the statement have? It has a lower bound, so var lower bound equals rewrite expression for the lower bound. Let me say upper bound, and then we say, I think body, right? And that would be a rewrite statement. So this is upper bound, this is body. And then we say if lower bound equals node lower bound and upper bound equals node upper bound and body equals node body, then we just say return node. Otherwise, we say return new for statement, bound for statement for node variable, lower bound upper bound, body. Um, and then I guess that's the same thing here. Condition equals rewrite expression for no dot condition. And then we say if condition equals node condition and body equals node dot body return note, otherwise return new bound while a statement for uh, condition and the body. Yeah, now it gets a little bit more tricky. Um, what's it called? No dot then statement, okay. Uh, then statement equals rewrite statement. My else statement is, well, if no else statement is null, then it's null. Otherwise, it's rewrite statement for no else statement. And then the same, same thing if condition equals node condition and then statement equals node uh, then statement and else statement equals node else statement return node otherwise return new bound if statement for the condition the then statement and then the else statement. And then I think var initializer equals uh, rewrite expression for node initializer. If initializer equals 
node initializer, return node, otherwise return new bound variable declaration for node variable and the initializer. All right, so far so good. Any questions so far? Uh, Holy Tears is asking how do you do multi-line edits like this? Well, the way it basically works is you select the text and when you hit Control D, it will select the next occurrence for the selected text and then you get a character at that location. So the trick is usually to find some text on all the lines you want to edit and hit Control D often enough and then you get like a, a cursor. What's cool though is, you, of course, you, cursor movements work like this. Uh, but if you want to, but you can also do, you know, control error, for example, in which case you go one word to the right and just evaluate per line. So, for example, in this case, if I go one word to the right, then I end up before this, uh, before these. So now I have effectively carrots at different locations, but you can synchronize them by basically just using those guys. And uh, that's super useful to do multi-line edits like that. Um, okay, there's a tiny bug, I think, somebody mentions in the, um, in the REPL, I guess, show tree. Oh, you are right. Yes. That should have been show program. All right, that one is fixed. Um, now let's go here to the block statement. The so block statement is a bit more interesting. So the general pattern that we have followed here so far is that we try to not rewrite the world if nothing has changed. So in our case, uh, for the block statement, it's a bit more tricky. So what we would do is we say, uh, uh, I guess, statements. Um, yeah, let's call this var. Now, what is that? It's immutable array um, bound statement um, builder, I think. Um, builder equals null. Let me say for var i equals zero i less than no dot statements dot length i plus plus var statement and then we say we write statement for no dot uh, statements of i so if now let's call this old statement uh, old statement, new statement. If uh, new statement is not the same as old statement, then we need to say builder dot. So basically, yeah, if this thing doesn't match. Now, if builder is null, that means we need a builder. So we say, uh, immutable array create builder for a bound statement. Oops. Then we have to copy the existing statement. So we would have to say node statements uh, copy to from zero to i minus one. Uh, well, that's unfortunate. We don't have a copy to that takes. Oh, no, no, we do. Okay, so source index next destination is builder. Uh, you want to start at zero and then the length is i minus one, which basically copies all the existing ones over. Oh, God. Don't tell me that I can't do that. Now that is annoying. All right then, a follow up it is. For var j, 
j less than i, j plus uh, plus, builder add, um, yeah, the capacity of this guy is exactly the same as before, so we say it's, uh, what is that, node.statements.length, let me say builder add node statements j All right, and let me say if if we have a builder, then we say builder add new statement. And then we can say at this point, if builder is null, that means all nodes were equal. Otherwise, we say return new bound block statement for um, builder. Now we can say move to immutable, which is quite neat because we have we know that we have always the exact capacity. So we can basically just create an immutable array out of the underlying storage location without allocating a new thing. So effectively, what this method now does is it will allocate no memory if all the nodes are the same. Um, if at least one node is different, then of course we have to allocate uh, a new array, and that's it. But we try to minimize effectively how bad it is allocation-wise. And hopefully it didn't screw up the, the indices. All right, so now this guy will do nothing for now. So we just basically say, let's have a private constructor. Uh, and then just say public static uh, bound statement lower bound statement statement and then all we have to do is we say uh, var lower is new lower uh, return lower rewrite statement for the given statement. Seems reasonable. Now we have to invoke it, obviously. So that would be in our compilation. Uh, basically, in so we say statement is um, yeah. Let's do method we say get statement and that is var result is this one and then we would say lower what lower dot lower did not type this correctly It was curious. Lower for result and return that guy. Oh, that's just this one. And then we just say uh, var statement is get statement. All right, so now we make sure that we evaluate this guy. And we also dump this guy. So right now, when we should run this, yeah, nothing bad happens. So it keeps, it keeps working. Uh, fix bug and repo. And then we say, okay, so we have the boundary reminder. Um, the point, point, let me check. Statement, yes, you're right. Would have been nice to actually use the statement we just assigned. Good catch. 
All right, so this is the immutable, uh, the, the, the rewriter. Uh, this is the lower. And then uh, this is just the, the fact that we actually use it. All right, so git commit, uh, it's called this uh, add ability to lower uh, bound tree. A lot of curiosity, have I broken the build so far? No, I have not. All right, so. All right, so let's, uh, let's do our first lowering. So the first thing we do is we say protected override um, bound statement rewrite um, uh, what's this thing called uh, for statement. What we don't have that. Don't tell me I forgot to make these guys virtual. Ah, yes, I did. Ah, that is unfortunate. So they have to be. Uh, protected virtual. Otherwise, it's not going to be very useful. <laughs> so let me just quickly check that now we have the right. Yes, so this is meant to be an entry point, so that one should be public. Yes, yes, yes. So let's do this. Um, bum, 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 bum. Get to commit. Fix bound tree rewriter. All right. Now let's actually do this. Override uh, bound statement. Mm rewrite uh, for statement. So logically for i equals you know lower to upper body you want to rewrite this to effectively something like this. Uh, var i equals lower, I'm oh, sorry, uh, let's call this variable here, var, um, lower, of course we have to put this in a block, because we cannot you know, return multiple things, right? So we say block, and then we say while var, is less than or equals to upper um, another block and that is body and then it's var equals var plus one, right? That's effectively what we want to generate. So let's start with the variable declaration. Our variable declaration would be declaration is new bound variable declaration, which in our case would be node variable and then node lower bound. Then we say var condition is new bound binary 
expression where the left hand side is a new bound variable expression what does it take it takes the variable of course so that's node variable and then the operator would be a bound operator bind um, the syntax kind would be syntax kind um, So this gets a little bit verbose, unfortunately, but we could have hyperroutines less or equals token. Uh, and then uh, the left type is type of int, and the right hand side is type of int. And then we say the other side is uh, node upper bound. Right. Then we need the increment, which is a new bound assignment expression for node variable. And then we need a new bound binary expression, where the left hand expression is a new bound variable expression, node variable. And then the operator would be. Let's try to make that somewhat readable. Uh, we need a plus token, plus token for type of int, type of int. And then the right hand side is new bound literal expression with the value one. Is that somewhat readable? We can probably new bound variable expression actually. And then we could just say this is a variable uh, expression would be var variable expression is. All right, so this one, almost good. Now let's say while block would be new bound block statement for immutable, immutable array create. Um, that would be node block. Uh, body, I guess, uh, followed by our increment. Yeah, let me guess. I have to say bound block statement. Of course, not enough. We just say new bound statement expression, expression statement. Because that's how our evaluation model works. Uh, sorry, it would be bound statement, not bound block statement. Okay, now we have the while block. Now we can say var while statement is new bound while statement, which would be, what is it, uh, condition followed by our while block. Let's call this the while body maybe. Um, and then the result is new bound uh, block statement for yeah, basically same concept here for um, the variable declaration followed by our while statement. And then we say return result. Uh, 
And then in order to make things not weird, we say rewrite uh, statement result. That makes sure that if we have any rewrites for a while later on, uh, they also get applied. And what's your problem now? Oh, protected. So this might seem like a lot of code, but here's the benefit. It now means that from this moment on, no more for statements. I don't have to handle them anywhere. So any, any analysis that deals with loops now, basically has a simpler way of doing it. So let's go to the evaluator now. Um, and basically we can say in the evaluator, well, for statements are gone. They cannot occur anymore. Let's make sure tests are passing. Wow, that's unexpected. Um, oh, here we go. Didn't Matt say that we should start using x is y and x is not instead of using double equals? Well, that is one of those things that I think is more esoteric than it actually helps in practice. Um, I mean, the whole argument of using x is null rather than x double equals null is that in principle somebody could override, okay, to find the equals operator and could decide to implement it in a funky way. But I honestly argue that that is effectively a non-scenario, so I, <laughs> I don't care. Uh, I keep comparing to null. Um, so why would we want to, write, to rewrite that? So like this one is basically just a simpler way for us to just you know, remove the number of concepts that we have in the intermediate representation. So once we have this one checked in here, uh, it gets a bit more uh, clear where I'm going with this. So, okay, let's add this guy and then say git commit uh, lower for statements into while statements. All right. So the next step is, well, we really don't want any loops, actually. We really just want, effectively, all loops to boil down to go-tos, right? Right now, the problem is we don't have any go-tos, so let's actually add them. But we don't add them to our syntax because, you know, we don't need it. <laughs> uh, we just want to have it in the internal representation. So we would have an internal sealed class bound go-to statement, which logically, uh, needs two things. It needs effective, well, does it need two things? It only needs one thing, actually. It only needs the, uh, the label you want to go to. So we don't have this thing yet. So we, let's add a label symbol. Uh, let's call this label. And then we say internal, actually, do we have them? What do we have our symbols right now? Oh, I put them here. Oh, it's fine. So let's say we have, again, since we can't leak them really, let's say we have a label symbol, and that one just is a, uh, doesn't need anything there. Uh, yep, the name is fine. And then of course we might want to have, eventually when we have more public symbol types, we also want to probably have a symbol base type uh, to make things a bit more sane, but for the time being, we don't need that. So now we have that guy, and then we just say this is a bound statement, obviously. Um, and then we say this is a bound node kind 
uh, go to statement which goes here actually goes here um, then what we need is we need uh, a way to define a label so that will be internal sealed class bound label statement uh, bound statement and this one so normally what you would think you would do you would have to say you would say label symbol symbol and then you would have you know the bound statement uh, that is the one that has the label applied to it but that's actually not what you want because that will force you to do crazy stuff so what you really want to do is you want to just say in my statement stream I can just insert a label statement and then whatever the next statement ends up being that's the one that's labeled because if you think about it very often if you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you rewrite stuff you want to just say well, I want to just have a label for whatever is after me, right? But you don't know what is after you, right? So uh, you just want to do that. And then, of course, uh, uh, you want to actually expose our label here. And then same thing here. Um, add null check. No. Yes, that's the one I want. And then I say this is bound node kind. Uh, label statement so how do they differ well okay so the label statement just declares the target and then the go to statement is actually the thing that jumps to it so then we need one more bound conditional go to statement bound expression condition bool jump if true I guess jump if false equals false um, and then this is the conditional go to statement This is basically our low-level representation for an if. Yes, so that makes sense, I think. So now we can say, move that, move that, move that. Um, Yes, now in order for us to actually be able to do anything here, um, let's go to our, uh, actually bound, I'm gonna put a bound tree rewriter. So this one also has to handle those guys now. So what do we have? We have label statement. Yeah. We have a uh, go-to statement and we have conditional go-to statement. They come all here, so they're all protected virtual. And then we can say, so label statement is just return node because there's nothing else to do. Uh, go to the same thing, and then this is var condition equals rewrite expression for node condition. Let me guess we didn't expose it. Yeah, it would have helped to actually expose these guys. Um, condition, and then we say if 
condition equals node condition, return node. Otherwise we say return new bound conditional go to statement for node condition node, uh, no, sorry, node label node condition. No, that will be not what we want. Condition and uh, no jump default. Okay, so that one allows us to um, lower stuff into that representation. Now let's actually talk about what that would look like. <clears throat> so let's start with the simplest thing. So let's say protected um, override uh, we write if statement. So logically what we want, we say we have if condition um, then so which is basically going to be rewritten to something like this. We say um, uh, what do we call this? Um, and it would like this. And you would say this is uh, um, go to if true. No, go to if false. Uh, condition end, and then we just say this is then. This is the simple case. And then in the more complicated case where you have uh, else, else, um, we would say uh, what do we want? Um, we want to evaluate the condition. Right, so the condition is false, then we want to go to else. Um, and we just fall through to the then part and then we jump to the end part. Yes, that is roughly how if would look like if we lower that down to just go to's. Um, so let's just do this. So say if note else statement is null, then let's do this. We need um, uh, bar result is new bound block statement for immutable array create bound statement whatever these guys are uh, we need a, a go to false is new bound conditional go to um, which, okay, we need a label. So let's have this private int label count. And then we just have a private uh, label symbol, generate label. And then basically what it does, it says var name is just, uh, uh, label count. Return new label symbol with that name. So we need a 
an end label and label is generate label conditional go to we say the condition is node condition um, sorry it's the end label for the condition and we jump if false true And then we need the end label statement, which is new bound label statement uh, for the end label. And then basically the things we want to return here is basically the uh, go to false, the node then statement, and then the end label statement. And then we say return, rewrite, uh, statement for result. And that one is, oh, <laughs> oh statement. This one is a bit more work. Bum, 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 bum. Um, but in principle, same thing. So we need now a few more labels though. We need an, uh, an end label and we need a uh, else label. Now what am I doing here? Uh, else label. Um, how does that work? So we would say same thing. We need to go to false, right? And we need the end label statement. We need the else label statement. Yeah, we need the uh, go to end statement. That is a bound go to statement for the end label. And what do we want? So there's like four statement in sequence that we want to return here. And that is effectively our um, go to false. Actually, let's call this go to false. Um, then statement, then it's go to end statement. Then it's the else label statement. Then we have the node else statement. And then we have the end label statement. Does that make sense? I think it does make sense. And now we do the same thing for while statements, which might actually be easier. Protected, override, bound. Uh, right, let's just say rewrite while statement. Um, so that would be bound statement. Uh, so the same thing here we have while condition. Um, let me say 
uh, body, right? So that's a bit more interesting. So what we want to do is, uh, of course, we have an end. Uh, we have a check. And the check is effectively go to false end for condition. Uh, well, I guess we have this right continue is. Uh, and then we have the body. Um, go to true, continue. Right, that looks right. Uh, not quite. Uh, go to check. So we enter the loop, we first jump to check. If the condition is true, we execute the body. And then we say, evaluate the condition again and then keep going back. Right? So this is the inner loop. Otherwise, you fall through end. Yeah, that seems about right. So what we need is we need, a, um, end, or we need an end label. Then we say var, we need a check label as well. Then we say go to check is new bound go to statement to check label. And then we say we have our uh, continue. Uh, continue label statement is bound a new bound label statement uh, that is our continue label then we say uh, so this is the actual statements now so we have go to check continue label statement then we have the body then we have the check statement check label uh, statement uh, is the same as this one. All right, let's just copy paste. So continue label, uh, we have a check label statement and then we have an end label statement. Um, end label and this is the check label. All right, so continue body check this is where we say var go to uh, true is new bound uh, conditional go to statement. Uh, it is the label is the continue, and then the condition is node condition and jump if false, false. We want to jump if true. Um, all right. And then the result is basically just this. So we start with the go to check. Then we say continue label statement. Then we say node body. Then we say uh, check label statement. Then we say go to true. And then we have our end label statement. It looks right. All right. Now, in order for us to 
actually evaluate this thing, what we really want to do is we also want to flatten all the code blocks. Because that basically means that when I execute the statement, I can literally just have an array of instructions and then just instead of having like this nested structure where I recursively walk the tree, I just when I do a go to, I just basically change the, the index into the, my instruction stream, which is more closer to how a VM would actually execute code as well. So the easiest way to do this is we just say private uh, uh, block statement, uh, sorry, bound block. So you only have one block effectively uh, in the root. Uh, and we call this flatten. And we say this is taking a bound um, yeah, it's taking a bound statement. Um, and then we have a, what do we have? A queue? No, we have a stack new um, stack of bound statement. And then we say stack push. Uh, statement. Um, let me say while stack count larger than zero, var current is statement dot pop. No, uh, stack dot pop obviously. Um, and then of course we need a builder new uh, immutable array. Create builder for a bound statement. Okay, if builder, nah, don't bother, return new bound block statement for builder to immutable. So if current is bound block statement, Let me say for each var s in block statements, uh, what is it? Reverse uh, stack dot push s. Else we say builder dot add current. Yeah, that should flatten that. And then we say var result is this, and then we say return flatten result. Fine, make it steady. Right, so the effect here is that all the bound blocks are removed, and it's just a flat list of instructions left. And only one root bound block remains. Okay, so then let's go to the evaluator and say evaluate statement. So how would that now look like? Well, So the root must be um, must be a bound block statement. Like that is guaranteed by construction effectively. So our our lower should probably express that as well, so we don't have to cast stuff all the time. So we say this is bound block statement. And then this guy basically says, well, okay, so what we need is we need a dictionary. So we need basically a list of instructions, right? Which I guess, now I can just say, okay, um, label to index is new dictionary uh, of int comma, no, of uh, label symbol. Um, 
int. And so now all we have to do is say var s in root statements. And then we say if s is bound label statement l, well, would have been useful to say for var i equals zero, i is less than root statements dot length i plus plus. Now we can say if root statements i is bound label statement l, then we say um, root add l dot label for i plus one. Right, so the index, so basically it's the, the index that this label statement refers to is the next one. And then why the fuck does that not work? Oh, not root, label to index, obviously. All right, and now we can say for each var uh, s in root statements, I can now more or less say evaluate statement. Um, however, realistically, what we want to do is we would say s dot kind. So block statements cannot occur anymore. We flatten that. Variable declarations can occur. If statements can no longer occur, while statements can no longer occur, expression statements can occur. And then what we now can say is case uh, bound node kind conditional go to statement, obviously. Um, and the other one that we need to handle bound node kind. Uh, uh, label statement, we don't care, nothing to do. And then this is the go-to one. So we have to say, okay, the, uh, yeah, so we say var index is zero. We say while index is less than root statements length i plus plus uh, var s is root statements i um, Yeah, we would have to do that, I think. Now, ah, what am I doing here? <laughs> Fine, I call this i for now, and then I rename it to index. Um, all right, so then we do this. Yep. All right, so go to statement, and in that case we say index is Label to index for uh, bound node kind, sorry, bound node, bound, go to statement s, which is somewhat of an unfortunate decision here, because it gets a bit on the convoluted side. But so be it. Um, if bool, uh, let's call this uh, conditional go to statement is bound conditional go to statement s, and let's call this 
make this slightly more readable. So that would be conditional, conditional go to statement label. And then we say uh, var um, condition is evaluate expression for conditional go to statement condition bool if if condition and uh, here goes a statement and not jump if true. Oopsie. Or not condition and jump if false, then we jump. And then we set this guy. All right, so who is evaluating this guy? Find all references, there should be any. Well, let's just say block statement should no longer trigger. If statement should no longer trigger. While statement should no longer trigger. Right, now this guy should no longer, yes, this guy is no longer used, so we can kill that guy too. Um, perfect. Let's try to run this and see what ends up happening. It doesn't even compile. What is the problem? Uh, well, we compilation, not CS. Um, get statement, that would be bound block statement now. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so let's try what happens here. So this works, unsurprisingly. Um, uh, bar result equals zero for i equals zero to actually now that I'm thinking about it I probably want to actually output those guys so we actually have a scene of seeing what's happening show program um, uh, var result is zero if one is if one is uh, less than one then we say result is one all right so we have a block statement a variable declaration a conditional go to statement a less expression, a literal expression here, an expression statement, a label statement. Yeah, so that is borderline useful. Now, the only problem that I think we want to do is we want to say uh, label symbol. We probably want to override. Uh, string to string to just return the name. Um, you can actually see what's going on. So if I say var result equals zero, if one is then result is one, else result is two, 
result. Mm, yeah, it's not gonna fly. Helps to type it. This is why I really want the new REPL, so I don't have to do these crazy gymnastics here. Um, uh, let, actually don't make it that big, because then I don't have all the space that I need. A result equals zero if result is less than, so if one is bigger than one, result is one, else result is two. No, actually I don't want to, I want to show the program. Result exits, no. I want to say var result equals zero. If one is less than, uh, or whatever, then we set it to one. Else we set result to two. And then we select the result. Yeah, clearly that doesn't work. I think somebody is uh, already calling out what the problem is. Um, let me just go back to the chat so I can actually see it. Um, Ba -ba -ba. Line 64, change end label into else label. Okay, let's try this. Uh, where is the lower row? Line 64. Line 64. I probably have. Line 91. Yes, that is correct. That would be the else label. Good call. Good catch. So let's try this again. Da, 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 da. So, show program. Here we go. That works. Now let's try our canonical var result equals zero for i one to hundred result equals result plus i result. Yes, not great because it seems like our loop does not terminate. Thankfully, <laughs> should have reversed. Uh, this year, so you can at least see what it compiled to. Uh, so show program. And then we say var result equals zero. For i uh, equals one to one hundred, result equals result plus i, result. All right. So what does it do? So it has a. So it declares a variable. Yeah, but we should also fix that one. Variable. Um, same thing here. We should we should just. Copy that guy here. Um, so I go to label two, which is here. 
And I have a conditional go to statement to label one, which is here. I say less or equals expression. If the variable is less than 100, all right, expression statement is an assignment, um, that is the increment. This is our loop incremental assignment. I think I know what the problem is. I suspect I have the wrong variable in the lower. Um, Well, not really. Mm, I am slightly confused why this will not work. So, So I declare result, I declare i, set it to 0, I go to 2, which is here, um, then I say, well, if i is less than 100, then jump. to two. Oh, I know what the problem is. I'm an idiot. Um, else for two. Yes, that's the problem. We keep running the check. All right, so now var result 0, 4, i, 1, 2, 100. Uh, okay, that's not happening. Uh, if only we had adding capabilities. var result equals 0, uh, 4, i equals 0 to 100. Result equals result plus i. Uh, Result. Here we go. Sweet. So we verified if we have um, verified uh, while implicitly by using for, and we have verified the for loops. So pretty much um, all the stuff should work. So now if I run my test, it should also run. Nice. Um, okay, let's do this and say uh, swap order or print uh, program and print source. No, print syntax and bound tree before evaluation. Um, Um, 
All right, so now let's commit this guy. Um, lower if while and for into um, go tools, I think. Yep. All right, not bad. I think that's it for today. So we're out of time. So actually, we are way over time. So let's just talk a little bit about what we have done so far. All right, so what I've done today is I have introduced the concept of a lower, which allows us to rewrite our bound representation into other uh, you know, bound representations in the compiler. And that effectively allows us to simplify the resulting language. It wasn't necessarily obvious from the code that I've written, but the idea is that after the lowering happened, you have fewer constructs that can occur in your program. So basically, you create a, a lower or similar representation of your language, which allows you to um, effectively emit code in a much easier way. Because in IL, there is no more while loops or for loops or you know, if statements. The only thing I have there are go tos. So if I can incrementally re rewrite my program into something that is very, very similar to IL, then eventually emitting IL is pretty obvious or pretty simplistic or easy, I should say. Um, and so that's basically what we have done today. Um, I think in the next uh, videos, I don't have a plan yet what I will do next time. I probably eventually have to move to functions, though, because right now the only thing we can do is uh, do our, um, um, you know, basically write global statements and variables. But what we really want to do is we want to have functions and be able to call them. So that's the thing I will probably add. Um, but considering all the hacking I just did because of my uh, inability to edit the REPL, I will probably squeeze in an episode where we just fix our REPL to make that actually a nicer experience so we can edit like decent human beings. So if we make typos, we can just fix them without having to go back uh, and type the thing all over again. All right, thanks a ton for watching today. And uh, sorry that it took so long, but sometimes you just mess things up and then it gets worse. Um, so enjoy the rest of your day and uh, hopefully I see you guys next time. Bye-bye.